A mega tsunami is a truly terrifying event. Thankfully, they're quite rare. It takes certain specific conditions to generate them. But in general, the predominant ways that they will be created is following a landslide, meteorite strike, man-made explosive detonation, or large-scale caldera forming volcanic eruptions that occur near to or directly impact a large body of water. I might be missing a few other ways, but you get the idea. Massive splashes, basically. Something like this occurred in Latuya Bay, which is located in Alaska in 1958, when a gigantic 524 meter or 1719 foot high mega tsunami was created after a magnitude 8 earthquake dislodged a massive amount of rock on the side of a cliff face, which fell directly into the bay below, spawning a tsunami that was truly the stuff of nightmares. So in Australia, we have widespread evidence of a truly cataclysmic impact event that happened fairly recently, and an associated mega tsunami which inundated almost all parts of the western and southern coastlines of Australia. A large comet slammed into the deep waters of the Indian Ocean, and it's thought this comet fractured into three pieces, two of which were much smaller and appear to have landed in different spots in the Pacific Ocean, making this a global event. And the reason we know this is because the rainout from these impact centres overlaps with the ones in the Indian Ocean, as this event also caused a worldwide deluge that lasted for weeks on end, as it vaporised an incredible amount of seawater which, upon impact, was converted into an immeasurable amount of water vapour that would then go on to travel with the prevailing winds around the globe, taking several days after this event to finally cool down based on studies and the link to this study will be located in the description below. But after this water vapour finally cooled down, it would finally be rained back down to Earth in a truly biblical proportion kind of rainstorm. And biblical proportion might just be the best way to describe it, as this rainstorm coincides with the flood stories that were told globally by over 150 different cultures. This comet was a shoemaker levy type of impact. The comet shoemaker levy 9 broke apart in July of 1992 and it collided with Jupiter in July of 1994, providing the first direct observation of an extraterrestrial collision of solar system objects. This generated a large amount of coverage in the popular media, and the comet was closely observed by astronomers worldwide. So the collision that occurred in the Indian Ocean was caused by a comet similar to the one that slammed into Jupiter. It's a comet, not an asteroid. The difference is an asteroid is made up solely of rock, whereas comets are a mixture of rock, ice and gas. If this was an asteroid, the impact would have been far, far worse, especially if it was a heavy iron-rich asteroid. The mega tsunami would have probably been at least one kilometre high if that occurred. The capital city of Western Australia is Perth, and as of today, it has close to two million people living in this city. It's one of the many places that were built atop the remains of the deep sea sediments that were dredged up and carried over here by the mega tsunami following the collision, which by the way left a 30 km wide crater after the comet had struck. But when it collided with the bedrock of the Indian Ocean, sand, mud, volcanic material and whatever else existed on the almost 4 km or 2.5 mile deep section of the Indian Ocean where this comet struck, got blown out in all directions. A large part of it was thrown into space as well, but the majority of it would be carried by the mega tsunami that was generated, only to be dumped here en masse 5,000 years ago following this event, changing the entire landscape literally in the blink of an eye by converting the previously flat land into a landscape dominated by sandy hills that were comprised of deep sea fossils, mud, and obviously, sand. Core samples taken from these sediments feature deep sea microfossils that are fused to extraterrestrial metals, and these metals could have only come from this type of event. So in this video we're going to nerd out on the geography of Perth as it pertains to the sediment left over by the mega tsunami that now dominates the surface layer and the expression of the land for many tens of kilometres. A really massive area of land was affected by this tidal wave of truly epic proportions. It swept inland for many kilometres, and it would have been a truly terrifying event to have witnessed. And if you're unlucky enough to be in the immediate strike zone, the chances of surviving this type of event are next to none. The evidence that we have of it are in the form of the arrow-shaped depositions that are left behind following the retreat of the mega tsunami, known as chevrons. These chevrons are actually how we found the impact crater to begin with, by studying which directions they went, and tracing them back to their source. 
after which deep sea seismic imaging was conducted in the vicinity where scientists thought it may be by ship until the crater was finally found. The cool thing about literally every single town that's built along the coast in Western Australia is that they are all built within these chevrons, blending mankind with the remains of a landscape forged by a truly destructive event, which deposited sediments at a vast scale across the coastlines of Australia. And you can clearly see the effects of it from Western Australia all the way to Tasmania. And I'll cover this in depth in my next episode. And there are some truly spectacular features up and down the entire western and southern seaboard. And on the eastern seaboard, there are some unrelated mega tsunami chevrons. So the waves would have absolutely inundated this area when the tsunami first struck, with a very conservative minimum height of 150 meters or 492 feet being attributed to it. Most studies think it was around 180 meters or 590 feet when it reached the shorelines of Western and Southwestern Australia and that sounds about right. This wave went as far inland as 30 kilometers and in some areas it went further than this. And the force of the initial impact when the massive wall of water struck everything would have been unimaginable. In some areas, entire cliff faces have been severely eroded to a dramatic extent by this single event. And in the northern parts of Western Australia, scars exist across large areas of the arid land, which have recorded this event better than anything else because of the climate. And whilst we will be covering this in the next episode, here are some pictures of the scars left in the land as a teaser. You can clearly see the direction they were travelling. So if this event happened today, the entire city of Perth would be drowned and destroyed faster than most could imagine. And the wave would travel over the entire city stretching all the way up to the limits of it, waning in its power most at the beginnings of the ancient cliff face that is comprised of over 2.5 billion year old rocks from the Archean Eon. These cliff faces start about 30 kilometers in, and it more or less broke the wave and stopped it from going too far inland. So if I was to quickly throw over a geological map of this area and take a guess at which layer this tsunami deposit is, I'd say it's either been broken up into two, so it's either both or one or the other in my opinion, but in the description for both the Yogenup Formation and the Bassendean Sand Layers make mention of dune quartz sands and heavy mineral concentrations existing pointing to these two as being the layers. And that would make sense because they are slowly being overlain by the more recently deposited sediments of the Guildford Formation layer, which is the most recent alluvial sediment. Now check this out, this is literally the entire extent of the wave in the grand scheme of things. Look how clear the difference is between the mega tsunami sediment strewn land and the cliff face all along the west coast. This is a rough limit of the mega tsunami. Water did move past here as based on topographical data these cliffs are between 124 all the way up to 331 meters or 406 to 1085 feet in height with it rapidly changing in topography between the drastic dips in elevation that you see. So we can see some chevrons that have moved past this point, but it's unlikely it really went too far beyond this peak over here. So interestingly and rather unsurprisingly, Perth's topography acted like a beautiful little funnel for this event, which would have contributed to the height of the mega tsunami as it began to ramp up and narrow as it entered through the funnel meaning the waves more than likely would have reached their highest here due to the funnel-like topography of the area. So it's actually possible that I'm wrong and that the wave was way, way higher and went way, way further. And there are chevron-like shapes that do go inland for many kilometers beyond this point, but I don't know for sure if they are chevrons or just chevron-like shapes from past tectonic events, with geological maps not really helping. I'd actually have to go here in person and take a look for myself or have someone to do it for me. So in general, Perth is about 30 metres above sea level. If a wave at a very conservative estimate of 150 metres hit this area, well, you can do the math. That's 120 metres or 393 feet worth of water covering you in an instant, smashing you at a bone crushing pace when it makes contact, thrusting you into a watery chaos of pressure induced insanity, taking you along with it for a very violent, tumultuous and bumpy ride and death. Poor animals man, dead set. This would have taken so many animals along with it and it would have more than likely impacted many indigenous communities too. What an intense and scary event. I'd love to know if any stories of it exist within the local tribes. 
In Perth today, you can really see the chevrons in the actual city itself. Here's a few over here near Allen Park. The chevrons are really significant on the edge of the beach. And here are some houses that are built into the actual chevron. And look how white these freshly exposed sediments are in these new industrial complexes. This is all deep sea sediment from the 12,500 foot or 3,810 meter deep sea floor of the Indian Ocean where the comet struck. Here we have what appears to be a slide of fine sediment which was thrown across the land rather spectacularly. I'm assuming this happened because it is the lowest topographical point in the area, where the most significant amount of sediment slid tens of kilometers inland. You can see the layers where it was deposited the most. This is Bold Park. It contains the chevron shapes that once would have existed everywhere on this land before it was largely leveled to build a city. So because of this leveling, you might think things don't appear to be that bad. Until we get to this point, where habitation and the alteration of terrain hasn't yet commenced on a grand scale, and we begin to see the size and extent of the chevrons that buried this entire area. On the topography, some of these chevrons are between 40 and 90 meters, or 131 and 252 feet in height. Towns are built around them in the lower lying areas. The arrow shape is ever so present everywhere here to a grand scale. This is the type of stuff that Google Maps or Google Earth would have a hard time conveying, and this is where this simulation shines. So these events are truly destructive, as we will learn in the coming episodes where we cover not only the mega tsunami damage but the deluge that followed. Let's pray that we are on top of any potential impact event that could create another scenario like this one that occurred 5,000 years ago that our ancestors across the globe somehow survived through with much difficulty. And I suppose we should thank those guys and gals who did. It's because of their sheer tenacity and utter willpower to survive that all of us are here today. So this is the violent story of how the land that Perth sits atop was constructed. A once flat land suddenly made mountainous after being buried by a huge tidal wave, more than likely stretching far beyond the conservative 180 meter tall mark due to the aforementioned funnel here. In fact, I've tracked what appears to be chevron-like structures up to 100 kilometers inland in some very flat places. One day, I'll go there in person to check them out, but the entire land here was dramatically altered after the waves finally receded. The death toll inflicted on life here must have been truly depressing to see, being surrounded by nothing but death in a place that was once home, but that now looks like an alien landscape dotted with weird muddy sandy hills that are scattered everywhere and that are filled with alien metals fused to deep sea fossils. This was a sad day, but unfortunately it was just the beginning, because the rainstorms that would follow in the coming days are what would really turn this horrible situation way worse, and the death toll to both humans and animals are about to notch up from regional disturbances to one that affects life planet wide as a result of this. But I think we've had enough cataclysm for one day and we'll save that for another episode. Thanks for watching.